You're tuned to KSJE, Farmington, New Mexico, 90.9 FM. And now, 103.3 FM, K277CR, Durango, Colorado. KSJE is supported by San Juan Regional Medical Center, whose vision is to deliver world-class care, making life better for the communities they are privileged to serve. Offering a comprehensive range of inpatient, outpatient, and emergency care services so residents can live life better here. San Juan Regional Medical Center, community owned and operated, here for you. KSJE is supported by the Animus River Jams, presented by the River Reach Foundation and the City of Farmington, Saturday, September 28th. Featuring a fishing derby at all Veterans Memorial Park. Free fishing thanks to the state of New Mexico's free fishing weekend. With prizes for kids under 12, teens 12 to 17, and adults 18 plus. Also concerts at the Farmington Museum featuring Shannon LaSalle and Tim Sullivan and Magic Hand. Animus River Jams on September 28th. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the Cop Shop with FPD. I'm your host, Chief Steve Hebby, and with me as always, Shanice Gonzalez. It's always. been a little bit. It has been yeah, a little bit. I'm so glad to be back. With me occasionally, whenever she bothers to make it, I guess, is a better way of phrasing it. We are coming to you from the mighty KSJE, uh, the, the heartbeat of the entire Four Corners area. Um, and we're on a Thursday morning right now. I know you will see this Friday afternoon at a regular time, but uh, the mighty KSJE will be making an appearance at the Balloon Fest. And so uh, we got bumped and had to come in a little early. Is that correct, Scott? Thank you, thank you Chief. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you for accommodating our schedule. Yeah, so we're a day early, um, but we are also lucky to have... Uh, the lovely Shanice has returned from her uh, two-week trip to Europe. Yeah. And so we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about that trip and her observations of the different cities. So why don't you start, Shanice? Where did you go? We went to Germany, Netherlands, and Italy. And which of the three was your favorite? So when I was there, the Netherlands was my favorite. Like, I just loved the canals. I loved the, the structures of the buildings. It just reminded me of, like, a Dr. Seuss book. But now that I'm back, I loved Germany the most. So, like, the food was great. I loved, like, the World War II stuff. Um, same thing. Architecture was amazing. Their cute little um, buildings. Yeah, I, I, I definitely have to say now I loved Germany the most. All right. Well, very good. So how did you survive the flight? Long flight. It is a very long flight. I wasn't so bad. Um, me and my daughter got put at the back of the plane where the seats don't recline, so the way there was pretty bad. Um, but my boyfriend is six foot, and so, like, he's Thank crammed, you. yeah. Knees are touching to the seats, so he had a worse time of it. But Middle seat. Yeah, the food's not the great, yeah. yeah. Um, and I was disappointed with the Italian food. Everyone always hypes that up. I didn't think that it was great, but, yeah. You don't tax or you don't tip servers. There's no such thing as free water. Waters are like $10 a bottle. <laughs> um, you have to pay to use the restroom. So there were kind of like things where you're like, what? Like, you're not in America anymore, yeah. <laughs> Dorothy. <laughs> so. Well, very good. Well, so if anybody is considering a trip to uh, Europe, uh, call Shanice at the PD, and she'll be glad to give you <laughs> some, of the, some of the big tips. Tell you all the places to go. That's we, right. we saw some awesome stuff. Good. Yeah. And it was two weeks. It was legit. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, well, very good. No, I have not done that, so I'll, I'll have to get on her travel agenda, too. The The other big news, of course, is we're, we're into football season, and I, I hate to say it um, because he'll gloat, as he always does, <laughs> but I think Scott's Buffalo Bills are 3-0 and to start the season. Yeah, facts are facts, Chief. <laughs> facts. Facts. What can you say? <laughs> can't dispute the facts. The 3-0. and uh, I remember when he was such a quiet guy. <laughs> I loved him when I first met him. Now it's just all ego and spiking it in my face. The Mighty Pack is not 3-0. and We are 2-1. and We are lucky to be 2-1, and uh, given the fact Jordan Love got hurt the first game. But we won two games with our backup quarterback, so 
Uh, so we're still in it. Sunday may be sobering for Bills fans. I don't know. With the Ravens. Oh, it may be for the Packers, too, because the undefeated Vikings invade. Uh, so, yeah, so we're back into football season. That came amazingly fast, uh, that we are already in in late September. I'm not quite sure where the year is going. but We've got National Night coming up October 1st, which is next Tuesday already. Uh, so we're already into October. The year is going fast. It is going so fast. I Yeah, when I first started planning all of these, I thought I had plenty of time. And then one month out, I'm like, oh, okay, yep. here it, we go. It races right up on you. Yep. Now, the good news is the temperatures are finally cooling off, and so it's a little more pleasant when you came back. Um, but you said you were at a soccer game, and it was hotter than sin. Yeah, and it was hot there, too. It's humid, though, so, like, we spent time on three different beaches, I believe, um, and so we're in the sun all day long, and, like, we didn't get suntan, we didn't get sunburned, and then I came home to a soccer game for an hour and a half, and I was roasted, yeah. and it was hot, and it was dry, and it was, yeah, it was tough. Welcome home. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to be home. That's right. So... Coming up, uh, the National Night Out will be October 1st. Scott will be there with KSJE. We're going to have a lot of vendors, uh, stuff for the kids to do, um, as always, and a chance for you to come out and interact with the PD a little bit. See she, Shanice, I know she's uh, now a popular Facebook star, so uh, you, know, you can get your picture taken with Shanice. Uh, otherwise, we've got uh, Balloon Fest going on this weekend, uh, which is how we're getting the big bump uh, to a Thursday morning <laughs> slot. Uh, so lots to do in Farmington because it wasn't that long ago we wrapped up Connie Mac. Now we're into Bloom Fest, uh, and, and then next week National Night Out. So we're we're getting into fall. The kids are back in school. Uh, school safety is uh, something that we were pushing uh, about a month ago as the kids were getting back to school. Slowing down around uh, speed zones and, and around the schools was a big part. And I think we really have had some success in, in slowing down some of the driving that we were seeing. Um, officers have been out a lot. Uh, we've made a, a lot of traffic stops. I know that you've seen us. Uh, I've heard some of that, that, that people are seeing the police making traffic stops around the city. Uh, but in particular, around the schools, continue to, to watch your speed and let's keep the kids safe uh, around school zones. Yeah, and it's all been positive. Um, and then just to piggyback on the National Night Out, so we have over 50 vendors, and all of those vendors will be providing a kid activity. This is a completely free event. Bring your whole family. The kids have lots of things to do. We do have free hot dogs until we run out um, and it's just a great way to interact with the PD and we have we tasked with the mental task force so there's lots of resources for mental health um, October is recovery month and so there's just a ton of resources out there so very good bring everyone so I saw Chief Starrett and I don't think he's going to be present uh, so have you reached out to him are we doing the Chief's challenge so I emailed him and I haven't gotten a response yeah I think so he's going to duck us uh, he may not be playing basketball, but I'm usually out there to, to compete against the kids. Uh, we've got a little basketball set up. I'm not a natural at it, but I can still sky, you know, so. You want to? We, we can do it. Ooh, a sky. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> That's not chief challenge. Well. <laughs> Scott, <laughs> I almost feel like that's old. That might be the most brilliant suggestion she's had. You have to wear jeans, though. Yes. Oh, well, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> Sorry. With you with the costumes, I think you can you can wear a suit. With My jeans costumes. are at the cleaners. I feel like All you're right. so competitive. It would be great to watch you guys. With this guy? Yeah. With this guy. Okay. Farmington Star and Chief of Police. Yeah. I like it. Oh, I have a box, Scott. If you're available. I love it. I'll check my calendar. <laughs> we'll block it out. I'll check my calendar, Chief. <laughs> well, well done, Chief. You've already made Scott uncomfortable. She came back from Europe a little different, yeah, a little edgier. Oh, she used to be so quiet and nervous to be on, and now she's edgy. <laughs> <laughs> so, for us, December or October, I'm sorry, is uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, that has been a big theme for us as a department this year. And we wanted to talk a little with you about um, what the department has seen as it relates to domestic violence and um, some of the numbers and, and then some of the stories behind the scenes because domestic violence is a, is a major issue for us here in the Four Corners area. I think it is for um, 
people around the country, but Four Corners area definitely, uh, we get a lot of calls for domestic violence. It is it is something that our officers respond to really on a pretty routine basis. And it's something that the department has made a, a pretty big focus. So, you know, Shanice, uh, you were getting some of the numbers together and um, you've been newer to the department over the last couple of years, but uh, were you were you aware that the police respond to so many domestic calls? No, and when I had requested this statistic, um, it was mind-boggling to me that in 33 months, we had 6,998 domestic violence calls for service. That seems like a lot. Um, and then we also had four related homicides in between 2022 and 2024. So. To see that it's escalated like that is scary, and that's how many times officers are responding to domestic violence homes. Yeah, so domestic violence calls are, uh, which probably anybody that uh, follows forensic files or, or any of the police shows knows, domestic violence calls are one of the more dangerous calls that our officers go on. There's a lot of emotion around, uh, around those calls, and you're going into people's homes. Uh, oftentimes there can be arrests, and, and there certainly is resistance oftentimes to having police intervention in those. Um, so it is a call that when we're training our officers and we're talking with our officers about about going in and, and handling these calls, uh, being aware of the danger that officers face um, is, is definitely one of the things we emphasize to our officers. Um, and you saw some of that really between December and in January of this last year, you saw a, a real significant rise in, in the violence associated with those calls. We had five homicides in about a month, uh, if you remember, and several of those were related to domestic violence. And then just as recently as last week, um, up at the Walmart, we had uh, a shooting, uh, in, in, and it was an attempted murder, uh, and then a suicide. Uh, in, by the suspect, and some of that goes to what I'm saying. They're, they are so unpredictable because of, of the emotions associated with the relationships, with the relationships breaking up, with police being involved sometimes, and so emotions run high, and, and that increases the danger for, for law enforcement. Um, but as I said, and Shanice was, was telling you, almost 7,000 calls for service uh, for officers in 33 months. Uh, in those, we took over 1,500, almost 1,600 um, investigations we, we formally opened and did reports on them, um, and, and then a number of homicides. And in this last week, we were, we were just fortunate uh, that it didn't result in a murder-suicide. Um, that, that certainly would appear to be the plan. Um, the victim was shot. Uh, but is recovering, and, and we're, we're optimistic that she will recover fully. But some of that goes to just in general uh, for, for law enforcement from the beginning. You know, you're, you're responding to a dynamic that you know is emotional um, and you know is, uh, is already heightened, that, that emotions are already running high. Uh, when, when you respond, oftentimes there's alcohol involved, sometimes drugs, oftentimes alcohol on top of it, which fuels an unpredictability of the call. So you know when you've when you've been talking with with officers, you know how do they feel about domestic violence calls? Um, with domestic violence calls, it's never only a one officer; they always have backup. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I think that that absolutely helps um, in in handling that, uh, especially mentally. What what kind of goes into the trainings for these officers? You know, when, when I was a younger officer in the 1990s, um, and, and policing has changed a lot, so anybody that tells you that policing doesn't change is, is just flat wrong. Um, and policing has changed a lot. When I got hired, um, we would go into the calls like that all the time by ourselves. Uh, it was just assumed that you're going to get there, you know, there's another officer coming. Two of us would get dispatched to, to domestic violence calls. But when you got there in particular as a younger officer, they wanted you to go in and make contact, see if you could sort your way through it, uh, and then you could cancel the other officer. We were shorthanded. We, we didn't want to tie up two officers if we didn't have to. But then the other half of it was they wanted us up there in case it was a violent encounter. They wanted us to go in and, and protect the victims. So the, the entire mentality uh, of policing has changed. Really now our officers get dispatched to those calls and we'll sit up the street until a second officer arrives and then the two officers go in together. And some of that's just hardened experience where, where officers get ambushed frequently when when there is going to be violence towards police, it, it can be an ambush as you're walking up on scene. 
And, and whether it's traffic stops or domestic violence calls, really the two most critical times for a police officer is, is the initial contact because there's you're you're determining how this is going to go with the with the subject that you're talking with, and and so oftentimes when officers walk up on a car on a traffic stop, it can go bad right there. Um, same thing with with a DV call. As the officers are walking up, and, and they are frequently exposed, um, and the person frequently knows the officers are coming. So that that is one of the most dangerous moments. And then the second most dangerous moment is, is when there's an actual arrest decision going to be made. So on a traffic stop, if the officers are, are looking at a subject for DWI or something like that, at the moment that they go to, to actually physically arrest someone, there statistically is, is one of the top two most dangerous moments. There, there's that fight or flight moment from, from suspects. And the same thing's true really in domestic violence cases. Because police frequently do go to these calls and, and we determine that it's it's just an, a verbal argument and, and we just need emotions to settle down or somebody's going to leave for the night, something like that. But at the moment that we've decided that there was a crime and that somebody's going to go to jail, that's the second most dangerous moment is now you're actually going to physically make an arrest. And that, that isn't just... Uh, that isn't just the subject. Frequently, there's other family members there, and so just in general, that uh, you you don't know who's going to react emotionally or how those emotions are going to play out. So right from the start, sending two officers to, uh, to make sure that that we have backup and that we have um, a greater chance of of dealing with anything that that would occur towards an officer is an important part of it. Is every domestic violence call? Is the victim set up with our victim advocates, and what kind of role do they play? You know, so the department does have three victim advocates, which is a, not every department. Um, we're we're one of the only ones in the in the area that have victim advocates. FPD has had two for many years, and and we added a third a little while back. That was more to focus on um, on serious crimes with. Uh, with our inebriate population uh, to make sure that we're working to bring them in. But, but all three of the victim advocates work with, with victims of sexual assault, with domestic violence, things of that nature. Um, yes, when we make a, a case with a, a DV arrest, we, we will get the victim in touch with our victim advocate. Now, sometimes they, they don't want that contact, and, and so I'm not saying that every case the, the victim maintains contact with our victim advocate throughout, but we definitely try and avail them of here's the services that our victim advocates can offer. Um, sometimes it's it's helping them navigate the, the criminal justice system. Um, here's the court date you need to appear at. Here's how you can get restraining orders and protective orders. Um, here's here's some resources in the community. Here's places you can go, like the, the shelter and, and things like that. So we have victim advocates that offer an array of services and, and help victims to kind of navigate a difficult time. And what about prosecutors? How does the department work with prosecutors on these kind of cases? So we, we work closely with the, with the San Juan County District Attorney's Office. Um, one of the challenges for, for law enforcement uh, has been, you know, what, whatever's going on at that moment in time and the police make an arrest um, is different frequently than what happens two months later when it's time to go to court. And so for a variety of reasons, victims can try and withdraw from the case, either to drop the charges or they just don't want to be associated with it. Um, my feeling on that really has been uh, we, we have everything on body camera that our officers uh, you know, all wear, and we have a lot of evidence that we recovered during these investigations, including statements from the suspect, statements from the victims, the scene, a look at the scene, a look at everybody's level of sobriety and, and uh, what level of emotion they're all at. Um, frequently, we, we believe we can go forward with cases even, even if the victim no longer wants to participate in the process. And we have been working with the district attorney's office to actually do just that. Um, so I, I think that it sends a signal when the police continue to go over to a, a residence, make arrests, and then the charges get dropped. And, and we, don't, we don't want that. We actually want there to be intervention. We want the courts to be able to get in there. Maybe alcohol counseling needs to be mandated. Maybe relationship counseling. Maybe anger management counseling. Something. We want there to be an intervention when we're going out and we're actually determining that there was a crime that was committed. Um, so we we have to have a good relationship, and we do, with the district attorney's office. Uh, and this is one of their bread and butter calls. Uh, I mean, it is domestic violence and DWIs that, that really are one of uh, two of the biggest calls that, that the 
DA's office deals with. Um, and, and we work closely with them as a result. And you speak a lot at the legislative session on being able to keep violent offenders in the system, um, and that is something that we struggle with. It is. Um, you know, we, we went through the... Um, we went through the constitutional amendment change a number of years back, which uh, got rid of cashless, you know, cash bail. Uh, so now everything's cashless, which means that the judges are are supposed to be empowered to make decisions on who represents a danger and uh, and keep them in jail. And then that got watered down uh, through Supreme Court rulings. And and that watering down looks like this: uh, you you can't take into account their whole history. Uh, you can't take into account the severity of the charge that they're uh, that they're currently charged with because they haven't been convicted of it yet, and and that is a significant change. And and now they've actually started to walk that back a little bit because uh, enough people have been released and then gone on to do extremely violent things, sometimes murders, in the wake of being released uh, when they previously would not have been released. So that has definitely been something that that I talk about. Even the special session, you heard it here with me. Um, if if people are looking for something they can do to make New Mexicans safer, let's fix the pretrial release system. Let's make sure that people who um, who have committed violent crimes uh, are kept in jail, and that the victims, consequently, and, and others are safe. Um, I, I do support the the criminal justice reform goals of we're not going to have people stay in jail just because they can't afford bail, right? So then it gets to be an economic: the poor people stay in jail, rich people can get out. Um, so I, I don't support that kind of justice system. But I do support one where we are keeping victims safe. And if you've risen your hand and you said, I'm willing to violate the law and commit a violent act against someone, and the police have enough uh, with a judge's oversight that we, we have determined there's probable cause you did it, uh, we're going to keep you in jail and uh, until we can guarantee that people are safe. And I'm not sure that we are really successful in that right now. That, that has definitely been... Um, one of my areas that I would like to see continued revisions uh, from the, the legislature and from the courts uh, to, to focus on victim safety um, and not just focus on, on the suspect. Three minutes left. You Three minutes left. And to next month's training? Sure. We can touch on it a little bit. Sure. Go ahead. Um, is it bi week or biannual or annually that we do the future chiefs training? We do that um, about yeah, one to two times a year. It really depends on the interest level for us. And when I first started that, I got to sit in on it and listened to the department teaching other um, commanders and law enforcement agencies and different officers and such um, on training just to what it takes to get to the next level and I thought that that was super interesting and then in my first year me and you taught a PIO class um, and this one is going to be in Portales um, me and you will have the same PIO class but I was looking at the schedule and you also have a class where you talk about what it takes to come into an entirely different agency from your own and take it by the horns and lead it and I thought that that was awesome with your experience. You came from Alaska. You've been here now 10 years. You're a New Mexican. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everything is <laughs> my green chili, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the New and Future Chiefs training is something that uh, we started uh, when I was president of the association um, the first time, which was 2019 and 2020. And there really was nothing within the state to prepare people at a command level to move on to the next step, to, to actually breed that top level of executive leadership in law enforcement. And I, I have always believed it, but as I'm nearing the end of my, uh, my term with every passing month, um, I, I really feel the earnestness of uh, we have to do more to develop good leaders for, for the upcoming generations over the next 10 and 15 years. And so these classes play a role in that. And Shanice and I teach a class to, to basically lieutenants and captains, sometimes newer chiefs uh, from around New Mexico, uh, to, to give them some insight into dealing with the press. Uh, dealing with the media, not having relations like we have actually deteriorated to with Scott, you know, to, to maintain positive ones and, and to, to uplift. Uh, so there's lots of lessons. Scott is actually one of the topics that we talk about. Um, but but in reality, I talk also about organizational change, leading or, an organization, 
um, because in policing it, it is we've got to continue to change and, and modify how we do things based a on safety for our employees but also be on the threat uh, and the expectations from the community so that will be happening down in Portales Farmington has hosted it a couple of times but it'll be in Portales next week two weeks two from weeks. now two weeks yeah. from now um, so Shanice will have a chance to go to the mic. Have you ever been to Portales? I have not, and I'm hearing lots of mixed things around the department on it, people who are going. Some people like it. Some people yeah, don't. Uh, it, it was interesting. I was there once before. I didn't realize they had such a large dairy business down there. I, I guess somebody moved from Wisconsin, if you can believe it, to Portales <laughs> and set up a dairy industry. They're pretty big uh, down there. So we will have a chance to go down there and... Uh, and pass on some of our experiences from Farmington to other departments around the state um, and, and you'll get a chance to tour the mighty Portales. So. <laughs> Can't wait. So two weeks from now uh, we will see you again. It will be on a Friday I, I believe we'll be able to make it on a Friday and we look forward to talking with you. Hope to see you out Tuesday night at the National Night Out or at the Balloon Fest this weekend. Until then uh, we'll see you next time on the Cop Shop with FPD.